Chapter 18, Love for Love. The winter of 1860-61 to 61 was unusually severe at Isola. The lofty summit of Grand Sasso, towering almost 10,000 feet into the clouds, was covered with a white mantle that reflected the pale light of the winter sun. Around the monastery, snow lay thick and heavy in the fields. Throughout the countryside, there was a food shortage, which as the winter grew more bleak and prolonged, assumed famine proportions. Day by day, the line of destitute poor seeking assistance at the monastery door grew even longer. Touched by their plight, the rector strained his slender resources to the limit by increasing the distribution of free food. He announced to the community that those who wished might leave an extra portion of their meager meal to increase the amount available for the starving families of the countryside. For Gabriel, who had a long-life passion for helping the poor, this was an open invitation to deprive himself of still more. He seemed so happy about it that few realized the extent of his sacrifice. Under his circumstances, it was an act of heroic charity. The ever-watchful Father Norbert noticed his acts of self-denial and took alarm. He again warned Gabriel of the danger of attempting to do too much and insisted that he should take sufficient to maintain his health during the severe winter. In other ways, that harsh weather told against Gabriel. He continued to lose weight, his face grew more emaciated, his flesh almost transparent. His thin body was shaken by repeated spasms of coughing. He gasped painfully for breath. His distress was plainly apparent. The small excursion seemed to tire him. He was so drained of strength and energy. Father Norbert was very worried. Little could be done during the winter, but as the warmer days of spring drew near, he made a determined effort to restore Gabriel's failing health. He was dispensed from much of the regular observance, not only from the night office, but also from attendance at choir by day. He was ordered to take long periods of rest and to spare himself as much exertion as possible. All these dispensations caused Gabriel many a scruple of conscience. He feared that Father Norbert was showing him special favor, that he was being singular, that he was not really so ill as to deserve such particular consideration. At the first opportunity, he appealed to the higher superiors to be allowed to return to the full observance, but his plea was disregarded and he was told to follow instructions and do as he was told. Gabriel was still reluctant to cooperate with these arrangements. To his fervent temperament, they were more of a penance than a privilege. Although not permitted to join his brethren for the public chanting of the office and choir, he continued to say it privately each day. As he had not yet received major orders, he was under no obligation to do this. He went further. Left to himself, he stood erect in his cell to say the office, just as he was accustomed to stand in choir. And he recited the office with such deliberate attention that he took as long to say it privately as the community did to chant and choir. When this was discovered, Gabriel was told that the whole purpose of the dispensation was being defeated. He was prematurely ordered to sit down in future if he wished to say the office. The new regimen helped Gabriel somewhat to regain his strength. He was able to walk a little in the garden and enjoy the benefit of the fresh, clean mountain air. His appetite improved, and he seemed to be much better. Easter passed, and by the time May had arrived, Gabriel was judged fit enough to travel with his companions to Penny Cathedral to receive minor orders. Father Norbert wrote to Sante Pacenti to give him good news about the forthcoming ordination and also to make a guarded report about Gabriel's health. To one reading between the lines, it is clear that the priest was more worried than he cared to admit, but at the same time he was cautiously optimistic about the future. In quotes, this time I can tell you that our Father Provincial has given directions that he is to be ordained with his companions, but the times are very disturbed and the bishops have prudently decided to suspend ordinations to the priesthood at present. If times improve, the ordination will take place quickly. Meanwhile, he is well. During the spring, he had to undergo a course of treatment for some slight stomach trouble, which left him very weak and run down. It also gave him chronic indigestion. Now, however, he's almost back to normal again. He's got a good appetite, so he's all right. End quotes. Gabriel himself also wrote home at the same time, but was careful not to mention his illness. Moreover, he was aware that his father was by no means well, and he did not want to add to the old man's anxiety. From the way in which he exhorts his father to bear his sufferings with patience for the love of God, Gabriel clearly shows his own reactions in the same circumstances. The letter dated May 9, 1861, reflects his own sentiments. In quotes, I learned from your last letter that God has sent you no small suffering. You may find consolation in the thought that God sends sufferings to those whom he loves. It is not a good sign to have all going too well. This is no time for ease. This is the time to suffer. The time to rest will come later, when it shall please the Lord in his mercy to call us to himself. 
At the present time, we are building the house in which you shall dwell, not for thirty or forty or one hundred years, but for all eternity, as long as God shall reign forever. Whatever way we build it now, so shall we find it in eternity. It depends on ourselves whether we are to be happy or unhappy forever. Courage then, Father dear. We are pilgrims, and therefore we must not tarry on the byways of this deceitful world, but must keep our eyes fixed on our true fatherland. Keep your eyes fixed on Jesus and Mary, and see if any of our pains can equal their suffering. Endure your sufferings then with a stout heart for their sakes, for they well know how to reward us. They who suffered for us are the King and Queen of Heaven. End quotes. Unfortunately, the long journey to Penne had disastrous results for Gabriel. He was still only convalescent, and the unwanted exertion of a rough trip over rugged mountain roads brought about a relapse. Indeed, the hardship of this journey could well have been the proximate cause of his untimely death. His slender frame became more stooped, and persistent cough racked him incessantly. One day, as he coughed, he felt a warm sensation in his throat, a hot, sweet taste in his mouth. He put a handkerchief to his lips, and when he withdrew it, saw the crimson stain of blood. At once, Gabriel understood and trembled, not with fear, but in a transport of joy and exultation. His prayer was answered. God was calling him in the way that he had asked, in the way that he had most desired. Half to himself, he spoke his thoughts. Dear Jesus, love for love, suffering for suffering, blood for blood. Although not the regular medical attendant, Dr. Reynold Rossi from the nearby village of Ticina happened to be visiting the retreat. He was at once called to examine the patient. Remembering the incident afterwards, he recalled Gabriel as a youth who showed all the classic symptoms of tubercular consumption. His face was pale and emaciated, his chest narrow and contracted, his fingernails arched and pointed. Having made my observations, he said I prescribed for him, and on a few occasions afterwards, when I returned to the monastery, I was able to help him a little. Once Gabriel's malady had been diagnosed as pulmonary tuberculosis, Father Norbert grappled energetically with the problem. In his own mind, he checked the possibilities. It was not a family weakness, for none of the Pacenti family had ever shown signs of it, nor did Father Norbert think it was due to the rigor of passionist life. For during the first four or five years, Gabriel enjoyed better health than before. Father Norbert came to the conclusion that a contributory cause was the hardship of Gabriel's hunting days at Spoleto, the long exposure to the weather, the heavy precipitation, the frequent falls and minor mishaps of which Gabriel had often told him. More probably, the damage was done at Pivercina, which had a notorious unhealthy climate. As soon as he became ill, said Father Norbert, I called in several specialists and carefully carried out the prescribed treatment in the hope of effecting a complete cure. Not indeed that the illness was anything new, for at that time the incidence of consumption was abnormally high and the mortality rate practically 100%. Still, Father Norbert did not give up hope. If science could do little to help, there was still the power of prayer. The community united in intercession that Gabriel's life might be spared, and a novena for his recovery was commenced. At Father Norbert's insistence, Gabriel joined in the prayers, but after a day or two, he defiantly approached the priest with an unusual request. Father, he begged earnestly, please let me pray to God for a good and holy death. If Father Norbert was startled, he succeeded in concealing his feelings. After a few minutes' reflection, he made a quick decision. Very well, then. Ask for your recovery if it should be for God's glory and the salvation of your soul. Otherwise, ask God to grant you a happy death. Now that he had obtained his wish, Gabriel redoubled his prayers. In a parodical called Science and Faith, he came across an indulgence prayer for happy death, which greatly appealed to him. He copied this for his own use and continued to recite it faithfully every day. Unafraid, he faced the prospect of an early death. He could speak about it with the utmost tranquility, even with joy of heart. His companions were astonished and wondered how he could remain so calm. In quotes, Would you really like me to tell you what I think about it? He asked one day with a smile. Well, I can assure you that I feel no sorrow at the thought of death. On the contrary, I fear there may be some self-satisfaction in the happiness I feel at the thought of dying. End quotes. Once when the topic came up in conversation, a rather tactless student asked Gabriel a point-blank question. What would you do if you knew you were going to die suddenly, to die in this very minute? I would go on doing whatever I happened to be doing, Gabriel replied tranquilly. It was of course the standard, the expected answer. But suppose you were going to die in the refectory, the other persisted, or out on a walk, or asleep some night in bed. Well, I'd just go on eating, or walking, or sleeping, until I died, retorted Gabriel in a tone that put an abrupt end to the conversation. Throughout the whole of this year, 1861, which was the year before he died, 
Gabriel seemed to act as if he had a definite presentiment that he had not long to live. Whether he recognized the incurable nature of his illness, or whether he had received a direct life from God in prayer, the fact remains that in some indefinable way, Gabriel was different. It was noticed by his companions. It was perceived, too, by Father Norbert, who declared, The new way in which God was operating in his soul made me certain that he was preparing to call him. He enjoyed such recollection of spirit, he was so detached from the world, that already he seemed to dwell more in heaven than on earth. Although he had made considerable progress in virtue during his life, his rapid advance during this last year was clearly perceptible. He maintained his usual lively cheerfulness, but in all his conduct, in his every action, a certain greater gravity and dignity was very noticeable. In the course of this year also, Satan from time to time unleashed the most violent attacks against his soul. Gabriel was beset by a tempest of temptation. Fortunately, he was sufficiently enlightened to recognize them for what they were to realize, too, the source whence they proceeded. But this did not render the struggle less arduous. Sometimes he was troubled with impure suggestions, temptations to blasphemy, unholy thoughts against God. So intense was this onslaught that Gabriel often had to seek immediate help from his spiritual director, to whom he candidly revealed his interior turmoil. In quotes, And it really seemed to me, said Father Norbert, that the evil one had loosed upon him all the powers of hell. End quotes. But once the violence of the storm had passed, Gabriel was again calm and serene of spirit, certain that he had emerged victorious. Worst in the sector of the field, Satan tried to exploit another opening. Now Gabriel had to deal with temptations of quite a different character. He was tried by scrupulosity and excessive fear. He felt unusual repugnance in fulfilling his daily duties. He had thoughts against his vocation. Long and bitter was the struggle before these repeated assaults against the citadel of his soul were finally repulsed. Since Gabriel had linked his whole life with the sorrows of Mary, the prospect of his life fitted into the general pattern. Before falling ill, Father Norbert carefully noted, Gabriel used to tell his companions that in the whole course of his life, six outstanding events had occurred for which he specially honored Mary, and that to complete the number of Mary's Dolores, the seventh would be his death. This was a somewhat cryptic saying, and it puzzled Father Norbert, for he confessed, what these six events were, not even I, to whom he confided everything, can say with any certainty. Through lack of further evidence, it is difficult to pinpoint the six events with any degree of accuracy. However, from a careful scrutiny of remarks made by Gabriel from time to time, it becomes clear that he had always attributed certain specific happenings to the merciful intercession of Mary on his behalf. One that he often spoke about was his narrow escape from death in the hunting accident, an escape that he always regarded as miraculous. Another, as is clear from the repeated references in his letters, was his vocation and call from the world. Two others, which he mentioned as special graces, were his speedy acceptance by the passionist provincial without preliminary interview, and his general confession at Loretto, which he never repeated. To complete the total, it is probable that the death of his sister and the painful parting from his father were times when he needed the help of special grace, times when he most assuredly appealed to his beloved mother of sorrows. But in the absence of more precise knowledge, such surmises are at best mere speculation. His illness afforded him golden opportunities of practicing resignation to God's will, opportunities which he utilized to the full. His resolutions reflect the fervor of those days. It was one thing to make them in the full vigor of youth, in the enjoyment of perfect health. It was quite another thing to be faithful to them when beset with pain and weariness, with the knowledge that his malady was incurable and that he was condemned to an early death. This is the point of some consequence. Considered in this light, these resolutions, in appearance so simple, are in fact evidence of the height of virtue to which he had by this time attained. In quotes, To accept everything in every circumstance, as sent by God for my greater good and profit, whether it be great or small, no matter how it happens, I shall accept all as if I heard Jesus himself say to me, I want you to do this, and I shall answer, Fia volitas tua not to show any sign of impatience, but instead to cultivate and display interior peace in words, looks, and actions, to suppress promptly all feelings, even sudden ones, and also even the slightest wish opposed to this peace." End quotes. At this time, Gabriel was in difficulties about writing home. To avoid causing anxiety, he made no mention of his own serious condition and again concealed the fact of his illness. His father was still very unwell, and in encouraging him to... 
His father was still very unwell, and in encouraging him to resignation in this trial, Gabriel all unwittingly again throws a revealing light upon his own mental reaction. As he wrote, he himself was passing through a similar experience, and the words flowed swiftly from his pen. Dated September 9, 1861, the letter was much shorter than usual. He was too weak to attempt more. In quotes, I am indeed sorry to hear that Pacifica is sick and that you are also unwell. Patience, we must endure all for love of Jesus and Mary, who have suffered so much for us. In this way, our pains will be easier to bear and we shall lose the merit of them. I am very happy, but the thought of the great graces God has given me makes me fearful of failing to correspond with them. Therefore, I beg you to pray for me and to get others to pray for me too. That's all I ask of you. That loving virgin of sorrows, who cannot behold our misery without compassion, holds us in peace beneath her mantle. The sword which pierced her most pure and loving heart is now wielded by her in our defense. If we show compassion for Mary and her sorrows, she will infallibly share in the grief of ours. Oh, how sweet and safe it is to surrender ourselves to her care. If Mary be for us, who, who shall prevail against us? As usual, I keep on writing more or less what I've written to you so often before. If anything should happen that makes it necessary to write, I shall fail to do so. If you don't happen to get my letters, you'll know better than I how very often they are liable to go astray." End quotes. One telling phrase in this letter underlines the thought uppermost in his mind. In quotes, the thought of the great graces God has given me makes me fearful of failing to correspond with them. End quotes. The fear weighed continually upon him and caused an untold anguish of spirit. As he was talking one day of spiritual topics, he astonished his companions by bursting into floods of tears. This was so unlike Gabriel that his companion anxiously asked him what was the matter. Gabriel bared his soul. In quotes, I feel so many inspirations, he replied brokenly. God is calling me to perfection. He wants me all for himself. And I, I fail to correspond. End quotes. It was his sole preoccupation, the need to correspond with grace, to surrender himself completely to God. No matter how often he examined himself, he was never satisfied with the result of his heroic efforts. Alone in his cell one day, tormented by this gnawing spiritual anxiety, he heard Father Norbert's light step in the corridor. Opening the door, Gabriel beckoned him to enter. When they were thus alone, he said with indescribable emotion, in quotes, Father, tell me if there is anything in my heart, anything at all, no matter how small it is which is displeasing to God, I am determined to tear it out at all costs, end quotes. As he spoke, he parted his nervously clenched hands in a forceful gesture, as if he would wrench from his heart the least fiber that was not for God. Greatly moved by his vehemence, Father Norbert gently calmed him with reassuring words. No, my son, no, I know of nothing. Resuming his way down the corridor, Father Norbert could not help reflecting on the extraordinary fervor of his young disciple. Over many months, he had had ample opportunity for observing him. He had noted his detachment and recollection, his obedience and his humility, his spirit of prayer, his extraordinary devotion to Mary. In quotes, Frequently and attentively, I have considered the life of this youth, he wrote afterwards, and I have asked myself whether there was any virtue belonging to his state that did not shine forth in him, whether it would be possible to desire anything more excellent than the way in which he practiced those virtues. Invariably, I was obliged to answer in the negative. End quotes. But Father Norbert was not satisfied to arrive at a merely negative conclusion. His private opinion went much further, although he took good care to conceal his thoughts. But in his own heart, he was completely convinced of the truth. In quotes, He really is a saint, he thought. Gabriel will be the first after our holy founder to be raised to the honors of the altar. End quotes. During this trying period, there were times when Gabriel again had temptations to melancholy and discouragement. Although he could look unafraid towards death, his thoughts dwelt more frequently on his soul's salvation. When dark clouds gathered around his soul, Gabriel found spiritual courage in his meditation on the Passion. Remembering that the saints often trembled for their salvation, he placed no trust in his own merits, but looked to the saving merits of the Passion of Christ. He often spoke freely on the subject, ever dear to his heart. In quotes, if God has gone so far as to give his only son for me, he said, if Jesus Christ has gone so far as to sacrifice himself for me in such a hard and costly way, if he has poured out his precious blood so liberally on my behalf, why should I fear that he will withhold the rest from me? It is so much less than what he has already bestowed on me. And have I not also a heavenly mother who will look after my interests with all a mother's care? End quotes. In the last months of 1861, Gabriel became more abstracted, more withdrawn from the world in which he now felt he was living on borrowed time. 
Several visitors who came to the monastery did not fail to notice him. One was Michael Diacangelo, who made his retreat for subdiaconate in September 1861. He remembered afterwards that, in quotes, one student stood out from all the rest by his look of piety and devotion. To me, he seemed to be in ecstasy. Such was the fervor of his prayer, end quotes. Later, he inquired about the student from the retreat master, Father Casimir, and was told he's a very good student. He's a saint, really a saint, but unfortunately, he's in bad health. A worthy priest, Father Anthony Passini, often visited the retreat and stayed for a few days. Walking in the garden, he chanced to meet a young student and greeted him in friendly fashion. The student passed on and made no reply. The same thing happened twice afterwards in quick succession. The priest saluted the student but received no other recognition than the slightest bow of the head. In quotes, As I am rather hot-tempered, confessed Father Puccini ingenuously, I was sorely tempted to box his ears, thinking him to be a little upstart of a student with no manners. End quotes. Barely controlling this impulse, the choleric Father Puccini went in search of the rector and launched a strong complaint about the student's lack of respect for the clergy. Having ascertained which student was in question, the rector patiently explained that he was a very regular and exact student and that he had acted correctly as the rule did not permit him to speak to strangers without permission. In spite of his annoyance, Father Puccini was impressed. Later, when all were assembled in the refectory, he looked searchingly for the student whom he now knew to be called Gabriel. In quotes, later on, he admitted, while I supper with the community, I was greatly affected to see him looking so thin and worn, sitting there with his head bowed down. In the very last months of his life, I saw him coming forward to receive Holy Communion, leaning on the arm of a companion, end quotes. As his debility grew more pronounced, Gabriel was no longer able to walk very far. He could only move slowly around the gate or rest in a sheltered corner enjoying the winter sunshine. Here he met a young medical student, Francis Diancini, a nephew of the parish priest of Isola, who was often around the monastery. Diancini asked the rector for permission to spend some of his free time with Gabriel, and a warm friendship soon developed. They talked of many things, and the visitor was soon convinced that Gabriel's mind already dwelt in another world, the invisible world of faith. Trying to recall details of the conversation years afterwards, Diancini said, in quotes, I can vouch for the fact that Gabriel's thoughts were constantly directed to heavenly things, and his chief preoccupation was meditation on the eternal truths. Indeed, he told me that when he thought of the eternal happiness of heaven, the whole day passed like a flash, end quotes. Gabriel spoke of the spiritual life and asked his friends some searching questions. Learning that he hoped to be a doctor, Gabriel was pleased but remarked that medical studies were long and arduous. He wished him every success in his profession and then added with indescribable pathos, in quotes, I shall be no longer alive when you have made a name for yourself as a doctor, end quotes. By a natural transition, they spoke of his illness and Gabriel quietly pointed out that he knew he was incurable. He realized that he had passed the point of no return and was beyond the stage where medical aid could restore his health. He added that he was quite resigned and even happy to die, saying, in quotes, The present life, this material world, is a nothing compared to paradise. End quotes. As Christmas drew near, winter once more closed its iron grip upon the countryside. Again, the snow lay thick upon the ground. Again, the mighty peak of Grand Sasso was capped with white, mounting guard over the little monastery that sheltered in its shadow. Gabriel wearily prepared to write his few Christmas letters, for in his heart he knew they were letters of farewell. The first was to his father on December 19th. The effects of last year's famine still lingered on, and as Gabriel sent his good wishes home, he added his customary word of exhortation about charity to the poor. Of himself he said little or nothing, although from the brevity of his recent letters, his father must have suspected that all was not well. But the carefully worded phrase, in conclusion, was ominous in his hidden undertones. In quotes, I hasten to reply to your dear letter. I want to say, first of all, that in time of scarcity and hardship, God will not fail to make the most ample provision for you if you provide for him in the person of the poor. Father dear, if it were not proved by experience, it would seem to be a paradox, even tempting God. What, to give all you have to the poor, and then to ask God to work a miracle so you should want for nothing? But this is more than prudence, this is folly. That is what a badly instructed Christian might say, but he would be mistaken. Listen to what God says by his prophet. Blessed is he who understands concerning the needy and the poor. The Lord will liberate him in the evil day. The Lord will preserve him and give him life. And note this well, make him blessed upon the earth and deliver him up not to the will of his enemies. The Lord will help him on his bed of sorrow. This is the literal translation taken from scripture. This is the remedy that frees from evil, that makes a man happy on earth and safe from his enemies, that consoles him on his deathbed. 
be generous with the poor, and don't be satisfied with fearfully giving them a look of pity and only a small bit of bread. With more than all my heart, I send my best wishes for happy Christmas. May Jesus, Mary, and Joseph make you happy in time and in eternity. There's no need to be so anxious for news about me, because when anything happens, you will be told of it. I never cease to thank the merciful hand of the Blessed Virgin, which took me away from the world. Give my best wishes to Gizmondi's family and tell them their son is well and happy. My regards to Pacifica and tell her to keep up her devotion to Our Lady of Sorrows. When you have time, remember me to Father Tatechi, wherever he is. Say a special prayer to Jesus and Mary, Mother of Sorrows, for my intention. This is the Christmas present that I hope you'll give me. End quotes. Despite his now chronic weakness, Gabriel earnestly sought permission to take part in the church functions on Christmas Eve. It was always one of his favorite feasts, as the poverty of Bethlehem was one of his favorite subjects of meditation. But the devotions of the vigil, which include solemn matins and midnight mass, were often prolonged for more than three hours. This would obviously have entailed too great a stain upon his failing strength, so permission was refused. As a special concession, he was allowed to assist only at the midnight mass from a place in the choir. He made his Christmas communion with great fervor, and his thanksgiving was noticeably prolonged. On December 30th, he wrote a long letter to Michael, now qualified as a doctor, and practicing at Icona. He began with a disarming phrase, in quotes, I have no special news to give you. We are in a lonely place here. No one tells me anything, nor, thank God, do I seek to know what is happening, end quotes. In this letter, he sent a special message to his sister Teresa, in quotes, If you think it wise, pass on this message to Teta and her husband. They should remember that the scene of this world quickly passes, that they should keep God ever before them and never do aught to displease him. No, not for all the gold in the world. It is better to suffer and endure for a few years here below and then enjoy everlasting happiness than to have an easy life for a few years and then to suffer not for ten or a hundred or a thousand or a million years, but forever and ever. Tell them, too, that God will demand an account not only for their own souls, but for the souls of their children. Therefore, let them try to rear them in the holy fear of God and not in the ways of the world. What reply will they give in the day of judgment if... Dot, 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 end quotes. To Michael, best loved of his brothers, he then spoke very tenderly of devotion to Mary, the subject ever closest to his heart. Having exhorted his brother to lead a good Christian life, he bade him an affectionate farewell. In quotes, there is little left for me to say, he wrote, except to remind you of what I've already said in my other letters, and continues, Dear Michael, remember, we cannot serve two masters. No one can couple together God and the world. Remember, it is a mistake to think that one can be saved by saying a few prayers, doing a few good works, and at the same time keeping one's heart attached to creatures, to amusements, to having a good time. You know that Christ has said that the way to heaven is narrow, and elsewhere he says, Whoever will come after me, let him deny himself, take up his cross daily, and follow me. O oh, Michael, believe a brother who speaks from his heart and who has no other wish save to see you truly happy. The desire to frequent such places, theaters, etc., without real necessity is most dangerous. And to expect God to give you a special grace to keep you from falling into sin on such occasions is foolish presumption. May Jesus and Mary grant to you and all at home a very happy new year. My remembrance to all at home. Recommend me to Mary that she may save me. That's all I ask of you. I am happy to live a hidden life in this religious house, and by God's mercy, I would prefer to be the most abject of my brethren rather than a king's son and heir to the kingdom. At this time, I might have been a priest, but the ruling about ordinations has prevented me going beyond minor orders. Since God wishes it so, I wish it too. Peace be with you. End quotes. Christmas had come and gone, and he had written his last letters. As he awaited the coming of the new year, he was both resigned and happy. He knew now that it would not be ordination year for him. God had other plans. But the thought of the seal of the priesthood, which would never mark his soul, was still close to his heart and could not be concealed. Twice, within ten days, he had written almost the same words, in quotes, At this time, I might have been a priest, end quotes. This was his hidden Gethsemane, his interior Calvary, his biggest sacrifice. Here was the echo and the fruit of his endless meditation on the Passion, in quotes, since God wishes it so, I wish it too, end quotes. This was his personal expression of the Master's prayer, end quotes, not my will, but thine be done, end quotes.